Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. You can please stand. We'll begin in prayer. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and over the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Father Sabatino asked me to read this prayer of St. Ephraim the Syrian. O Master who love mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teaching of thy, your holy scriptures. Instill in us also the fear of you and of thy blessed commandments that we may overcome all carnal desires entering upon a spiritual life and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and to you we render glory, together with your Father and your all-holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. The Catechism says that in, in paragraph 115, so you can just put CCC, Catechism of the Catholic Church, 115. Uh, um, according to an ancient tradition, one can distinguish between two senses of Scripture, the literal and the spiritual. The latter being subdivided into allegorical, moral, and anagogical. We're not going to get into that. What I want you to hold on to is that there are two primary senses of Scripture, the literal and the spiritual. The profound concordance of the four senses guarantees all its richness to the living reading of Scripture in the church. The literal sense is the meaning conveyed by the words of Scripture and discovered by exegesis, uh, the, 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 the reading out, if you will, of, of, this, of, the, of the text of Scripture, following the rules of sound interpretation. All other senses of Scripture are based on the literal sense. Okay, All other senses of Scripture, all other meanings of the Scripture are based on the literal sense. Well, what exactly is the literal sense? The literal sense is... The best way to describe it is the intention of the author. And of course we know that there's two authors to the scripture, the human author and the divine author. Okay, And so here in the book of Genesis, tradition tells us and the scriptures tell us that Moses is the author of this text. And for our purposes here, we're going to go ahead and, 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 uh, and keep that tradition alive because I think it helps us to understand what's being written. What was Moses' intention in writing the text? Who was he writing it to? Why was he writing it? And then you also have the divine author, of course. What was God's intention in inspiring Moses to write these facts down? And who did God want this text written for? Okay, And that's where the Catechism says, according to this ancient tradition, that there's also a spiritual, a spiritual sense of the Scriptures. In other words, we're not just talking about a historical narrative in Genesis. That God intends this historical text to also have application further than its original audience. And that further is the audience that's reading it today. So there's also this spiritual sense of Scripture. But again, that spiritual sense is based upon the literal sense. It's so fundamental to understand that. I just spent a week and a half with the missionaries of charity in Germany pounding them over the head with this fact because too often we open our Bibles and we begin reading expecting the Word of God to speak to my heart. And unfortunately, sometimes we flip open our Bibles and we open to the book of Leviticus. Okay? What is the literal sense of the text? Not the literalistic sense. And what do I mean by that distinction? The literalistic sense of the text is to take the words of Scripture and the stories of Scripture at face value, at a very surface level. But of course, we know that in the Scriptures... You're back. Welcome back. We know in the Scriptures that there's a deeper meaning uh, than what we're able to grasp simply on a surface reading. And many people make a mistake trying to be very faithful to God 
very traditional in the reading, to take a literalistic approach to Scripture. So that everything in the scripture has to mean exactly what it comes across on the surface and nothing more. And that's a mistake. We have to seek behind the text why the author is writing in this way. Let me give you an example. There are seven days in the story of creation. Do I believe God created in seven days? Fine, I have no problem with it. And the church has no problem with that. Augustine says, well, it could mean seven ages. I have no problem with that either. Because the purpose of a seven-day creation is deeper than simply the fact that God created in seven days. The word seven in Hebrew shares a common root with the word oath or covenant. God created within a seven-day structure to communicate something more to us than the fact that He simply created in seven days. He's communicating that He desires to have a covenant relationship with us. This has everything to do with the life of Abraham. Because Abraham is going to enter into that covenant with God. And oftentimes, we're going to see repetitions of seven in the text communicating to the reader who's going beyond the literalistic reading and to a literal reading. What was the author intending by dividing the story of creation into seven days? He was intending to show us that God desires to share his life with us. It is similar in the life of Abraham. We're going to see that Moses uses many literary devices to make his point clear. Does this mean that these things did not happen this way? Not at all. It just means that there is a deeper meaning to why it happened this way. And this includes the context, not only of who Abraham was, but also the context of who was writing, Moses, when he was writing during the Exodus, why he was writing to show that God was fulfilling his promises. Again, does this mean that it did not happen this way? No. It just means that it has a deeper meaning and Moses is picking certain facts and highlighting them to make his point clear. If we read with this perspective, through the eyes of Moses, if we read through the eyes of Moses, we're going to get a lot more out of the text and then be able to understand the spiritual sense. And so the first question I want to put to you or, or, or theme or idea that we need to put forth and keep in front of us at all times is a, a phrase I've repeated many times to you, and you could probably finish the, the phrase for me, that a text without a context is no text at all. A text without a context is no text at all. Anyone can pick a verse here and there and make it mean what they intend it to mean or what they want it to mean. Without asking the question, what is the context of this person's life, this verse that we're reading? What is the context of the entire story? And the context of the story of the life of Abraham is revealed to us very clearly in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 11. If you want to turn there with me, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 11. You can even put a little marker in your Bible because we're going to be coming back to Hebrews um, many times. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. If Abram is our father in the faith, if Abraham, as he receives his name, is our father in the faith, then here's our definition really of who Abraham is. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old received divine approval. By faith we understand that the world was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made out of things which do not appear. And come down with me to verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was to go. By faith, he sojourned in a land of promise as a foreign foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Okay? This text lists a number of men of the old world, Enoch and Noah and Abraham. 
And then in verse 13 says, These all died in faith, not having received what was promised, but having seen it and greeted it from afar. Some of you were at our fifth anniversary. This was the text I was trying to quote from memory because I stupidly didn't have my Bible with me. (laughs) Well, I did. It was just in the van down the street. Anyways, notice the difference between verse 1 and verse 13. Faith is the thing, is the hope in things not seen. But verse 13 says what? Having seen it and greeted it from afar. Faith begins to give a vision, although unclearly, of that which God is going to bestow upon the person. This is the image of Abraham, or I should say Abram, Abraham, in between the covenant change. Abram is a man who cannot see, who becomes Abraham because of his sight. His sight is his sight of faith by which he begins to see even from afar that which God has prepared for him. He is a great image for our life. And as we, as we look at the story of Abraham, my friends, you're going to ask yourself, why aren't there thousands of people here to learn about him? Because we can learn how God is dealing in our own life through the life of Abraham. And that is the purpose of the sacred scriptures, to reveal to us the hand of God as he's led men after men after men through the scriptures, through salvation, through their sin and difficulties to him. And this exact pattern is taking place in our own life. He is our father in faith who perceived though unclearly. Who is Abraham? Who is Abram? His, me- his name literally means exalted father. Exalted father. Take a look back at Genesis with me. If you want to leave a little marker in your Bibles in Hebrews, we're going to be coming back to Hebrews a number of times tonight. But take a look back in Genesis with me to Genesis uh, chapter 12 or chapter 11. In chapter 11, we meet Abram for the first time in verse 27. Now, these are the descendants of Terah. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Terah. These, I'm sorry, and Haran. If you look above that text, you'll notice in your Bibles one of those God-awful things that we always meet in our Bibles and hate, a genealogy, right? Right? <laughs> But the genealogy is extremely important. It's there for a purpose. It's there to connect the dots for us. And if we skip it, we'll miss the purpose of the text. Okay? Chapter 11, verse 27. Verse 27. The, what is the purpose of this genealogy? To connect Abram to his forefather. And which forefather is Moses connecting him to? Verse 10. Verse 10. These are the descendants of Shem. Now, who is Shem? The third son of Noah. Now, some of you have been through our salvation history course with me before. I am going to be talking about some similar things right here at the beginning. Be patient with me. It's simply by way of reminder, I'm going to be going fast. So for those that have not gone through it before, uh, the Swords and Serpents series in the back, the CDs, a six-part series, you're more than welcome to grab hold of that and listen to it on your own. Abram is the tenth in the generation from Shem, from Shem to Abram, the tenth in the generations. Okay, why is this important? As I said before about the number seven, similarly with the number of ten, oftentimes the Hebrew people used numbers to indicate certain ideas, and those ideas are very closely related oftentimes, and the number 10 as the number 100 or the number 1000 is often used to show fulfillment, completion, or even perfection. You say, well, I thought that was the number 7. Well, yes, 7 approaches the same idea, but from the perspective of the covenant, from the perspective of the covenant. And here we have On the tenth generation, the exalted father, who is one of three sons. Where else have we seen a man who's very important in the scriptures, who has three sons? 
Ah, Noah also has three sons. Exactly. In chapter 5 of Genesis, and I'm not going to spend any time there, but you could just kind of look at it if you want generally. It's in chapter 5. Did the genealogy from, from Seth, the third son of Adam, is given. Ten generations are counted from Seth to Shem. Abram is a new Shem. Why is that important? What, what, what does Shem do in the story of Noah? What does he receive from Noah, his father? He receives a blessing to become head of the family. Exactly. And again, I'm going to go very quick through these things. And so you can, as you like, go back and, and listen to that series or listen to this talk tomorrow with your Bibles in hand and go count these things out if you want. I asked the question, who is Shem? In chapter 9 of Genesis, chapter 9, verse 18, we find out that he is the eldest son of Noah. The eldest son of Noah. And his name, the name Shem, literally means name. name. It literally is translated as name. Why is that important, Bob? Uh, because... Uh... Uh, Yahweh was also a name. Uh, okay, Yahweh was also a name. Everybody's got names. Come on, why is it important, guys? Because the name tells you what you do. A name certainly tells... It, the name is more than what you do, Bob. It's, it's the person, their entire personality, and their entire possessions. I was thinking through the idea of the name, and I think it really is encapsulated by the idea of the whole person including their, if you can say, their kingdom, or that which they are over. It's very important because we talk about those who try to make a Shem or name for themselves versus those who make a name for God. And this comes out right at the beginning of the story after the fall. If you take a look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 17, verse 17, you'll see that Cain builds a city, and names the city after his son. He names the city after his son. You say, well, come on, that's normal. But Moses here in the text is trying to communicate something deeper to us. When Seth is born, who replaces Abel, we get in verse 26 of chapter 4, to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, men began to call upon the Shem of the Lord, or the name of the Lord. We have a division between those who call upon the name of the Lord and those who try to glorify their own name on the earth. Shem, the son of Noah, is given the name. He receives the name, he doesn't take it. Very important, because Abram is about to come into the story in the 10th generation as a new Shem, as one who receives the name from his father. I'm going to do this very quick for those that have been here with me before, but I have to do it to lay the groundwork for what we're going to be doing later, and that is to talk about the fall of Noah in chapter 9, verse 20, when Noah becomes drunk, and lays naked in his tent. And it says that, Lo, that Noah laid naked and Ham, his son, saw his nakedness. This is a Hebrew idiom to see the nakedness of the father. Leviticus chapter 19, chapter 18, verse 6. Chapter 18, verse 6. You don't have to turn there. Tells us to behold the nakedness of the father is to see in a biblical sense, the nakedness of your mother. In the fall of Noah, the story that is given is a very sad one, that Ham has relations with his mother and ends up having a son out of those relations in verse 24, when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest or littlest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan. So Canaan, the son of Ham, receives the curse because he is the product, if you will, of this illicit union. And you can go and look at Leviticus 18, verse 6 on this. A Hebrew idiom, to see the nakedness of your father is to see 
to behold, to know the nakedness of your mother. Why would Ham do this? Why would Ham do this to his father? Because there was one way in that ancient world in which you could supplant the authority of one who was head over you or head of the household or to supplant the authority of the king and to become king in his place. And it was to have relations with his wife. This happens over and over again in the scriptures. It happens to David. Not that David does it, but his son Absalom does it in front of all of Israel, to claim the throne which he was not going to receive. Ham is not the oldest son. Therefore, he would not have received the throne of his father. He would not have received the blessing. Shem was to receive the blessing and to become head of the house. And so Ham has relations with his mother in an attempt to steal, to take what was not his to take. And what was he trying to take? The name. He was trying to make a Shem, if you will, for himself rather than calling upon the name of the Lord and asking for the Lord's blessing. Receiving the name from the only one who could give it to him. Does that make sense, everyone? You're with me? You all awake? Yes. Okay. In chapter 10, again, very quickly, you'll notice there's a genealogy in chapter 10. That genealogy is intentionally reversed. It gives you the youngest up to the oldest. The oldest is listed last. This never happens. This never happens in genealogies of the Hebrews or the Semitic peoples. They always list the oldest first. But here Moses intentionally reverses the genealogy. You'll see that Japheth is mentioned first in verse 2, then Ham in verse 6, Canaan, his son, in verse 15, and finally Shem. Why is that done? Why is that done? Because you'll notice, I should have this over there, so I don't have to keep walking back and forth. You'll notice that in chapter 11... I'm just going to leave this up here as that final genealogy given. Shem's genealogy is repeated again. In what verse, guys? In chapter 11. In verse 10. No, that's the first one. In verse 27. No, I'm sorry. Chapter 11, you're right, it is verse 10. Okay, chapter 11, verse 10. Okay. And before that, it's listed in chapter 10, verse 21. Why? In between those two texts, what was that, 21? In between those two texts, you get a very important story, starting in chapter 11, verse 1, the story of Babel. And notice the... I didn't even finish writing that, you know what I'm saying. The story of Babel. Notice in the midst of the story of Babel, in verse 4... Then they said, come, let us build an, for ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the heavens and let us make a name. Shem or name for ourselves. The name, the one who has the name by right frames the one who does not have it by right, but tries to make a name for himself. Who are these people? Who are these people in chapter 11 that try to make a name for themselves? Take a look at verse 2. And men migrated from the east. They found a plain in the land of Shinar. These are men living in the plain, in the plain of the land of Shinar who try to make a name for themselves. Big deal, Deacon Sabatino. Big deal. Who are the men that live in the land of Shinar? We're told in chapter 10... In chapter 10, verse 10, the beginning of his, this is Nimrod, the mighty hunter, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, all of them in the land of Shinar. The sons of Ham try to make a name for themselves. Why? Well, like father, like son. They learn from their father, Ham, who tried to usurp the throne, trying to make a, a Shem for himself. And now his descendants try to do the same thing. The descendants of Ham, especially the Canaanites, will again and again try to make a Shem for themselves versus those who receive their name from God. And let me put in one more piece of the puzzle for you. In chapter 11, verse 1, 
Now the whole earth had one language and few words, and men migrated from the east. From the east. Okay? I want you to look at your, Bible, or your map in front of you and find Ur of the Chaldees at the beginning of where Abraham uh, took off from before, as, on his way to Canaan. Find it there on your maps. It's kind of in the middle almost, to the right a little bit. See it there? He ends up in Jerusalem. Find Jerusalem. You see Jerusalem? It's a long trip. Yes, in which direction, Bob? We see people here that are migrating from the east and trying to make a name for themselves. And we're about to meet one man who also migrates from the east, but does not try to make a name for himself. He receives his name, his blessing, his kingdom from God. There's going to be a distinction between these people, these descendants of Ham and the Canaanites, and Abram, who's a descendant of Shem. Shem or Sem. So where we get the word Semite from. A Shemite. A Semite. Again, I ask you about this directional thing. Why is it important? Flip your Bibles back with me very quickly to Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. In verse 24, we have the story of the casting out of Adam and Eve from paradise. And on what side of the garden does, does, is the angel placed? On the eastern side of the garden. And so in which direction were Adam and Eve exiled? Toward the, toward the east. They were exiled toward the east. Flip your Bibles one page to chapter 4, verse 16. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, east of Eden, away from the presence of the Lord. The direction of exile is always toward the east. But in chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 11, verse 1, we have a group of people who are moving in which direction? Toward the west, trying to make a name for themselves by building a tower to God. Okay? We are also now going to get Mo, uh, Abram, who's going to move in this similar direction. Okay, we're going to hold on to all of that and turn to chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 27. Now these are the descendants of Terah. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. This could be this, it's possible this is the same Haran that is the, the, the brother of Abram, or it's possible it's also a different Haran because his daughters are mentioned there probably to identify him apart from the other Haran, but regardless. Verse 30, now Sarai was barren. She had no children. We all, and we, th- those of us that like to read the Bible, you know when you find somebody who's barren in the Bible, God's going to act. God's going to make something special happen. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to go to the land of Canaan. So remember this. The purpose of leaving Ur was to go to Canaan. But what happens in our story? Where do they end up staying? They st- exactly. They end up staying in Haran. Okay? And there in Haran, the days of Terah are completed, and he dies. Okay? Abram's father dies in uh, in Haran, and Abram leaves Haran to go to the promised land. But the Bible, the way it's written there, would indicate that it's after Terah's death that Abram leaves. But it's not the case. It's not the case. If you take a look at chapter 11, verse 26, when Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram. 70 years. And in chapter 12, verse 4, 12 verse 4, Abram, so Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Come on, my math geniuses. 
How many years? 145. Am I right? Am I right? Look at chapter 11, verse 32. Chapter 11, verse 32. How old was Tira when he died? 205 years old. Tira was still alive. Abram's father was still alive when Abram left his father's house. Why is that important? Because it indicates that Abram left for a reason. He did it intentionally. And there's a reason why he did it intentionally. And it has to do with the life of Terah in Haran. Both Haran and Ur worshipped pagan gods. They worshipped the moon god. God needed to pull Abram from this context, from this situation, to bring him into a place where he could find freedom to worship the one God, the true God. We, we hear about this, and we're going to turn there for lack of time, but Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, you can write that down. It says there that Terah and his fathers worshipped pagan gods. Abram needed to get himself out of this situation. Or we could say that God needed to get Abram out of this situation. In chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who curses you I will curse. And in you or by you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Notice, number one, that God speaks to Abraham in chapter 12, verse 1. The relationship is going to change later on. But right now, at this point, God reveals himself, but not fully. Abram must trust the word of God. And we find out in chapter 11 of Hebrews that we looked at earlier, that Abram did trust the word of God. He began to see, if you will, He greeted it from afar. I want you to turn back, though, to Hebrews to chapter 6. And you keep your hand in Genesis, because we're going to be going back there. Chapter 6, verse 13. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. Helps us understand the whole story of the life of, of Abram. Because there's a division between chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, in which God promises what he's going to do to Abram, and the rest of the story in which he reveals or confirms his promise by a covenant with Abram. And we get this in verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently endured, obtained the promise. Right? He began to see. Men indeed swear by greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. Okay, so you have the promise, and you have the oath, or the covenant that takes place. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he interposed with an oath. Okay? And here we have the division between chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, which is, the, to- which is the, the place of the promise, and what we're going to see through the rest of the life of Abram, or Abraham, uh, the fulfillment in the covenant. If those that have come in late don't have a Bible, there are some back behind the CDs. So first we have trust, and then we have the covenant relationship. Scott Hahn, in his, in his book, Father who keeps his promises, which I do highly recommend to you. On the back side of your, uh, your sheet there, where I make that, that little copy for you of that diagram, lays out three promises and three covenants in chapter, in chapter uh, what does he have, 12, 15, and 17? Is that what he has there? 17. 15, 17, and 22. Fine. 15, 17, and 22. And then the fulfillment of those covenants later on in the life of Israel. It is a helpful structure, certainly. And I think it can help you to kind of make sense of the structure of what's going on. He's dividing chapter 12, verse 1, into three promises. Or chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, into three distinct promises. It's important, however... 
to not think of the covenant as something outside of Abraham. It's not, I couldn't come up with a better word than, than plastic, but it's not something that's constructed, if you will, as an exterior reality. A covenant is a relationship between two people. It's something very close. It's the sharing of two hearts. It's the two becoming one flesh, if you will. It's not something outside of us. It is a relationship which will be manifest in various ways. The blessing of God is the covenant. And the nationhood, the name, and the ability to bless to the world will be a result of that initial covenant or blessing. I say this because I think we can go a little bit too far. I'm not going to say Scott Hahn is wrong because you guys are probably all shoot me up here. So I'm not going to say that. However, I think we can go a little bit too far in trying to dissect the text into exactly these three promises, these three covenants, and these three fulfillments. I think there's something a little deeper in the text. Because a blessing from God is itself the beginning of the covenant. The blessing of God is the sharing of his life with the thing that is blessed. Right? We say a blessed thing is is something that becomes holy. Holiness is an attribute of God alone. A thing which is blessed is something that partakes in the divine nature. It shares in God's life. And so the blessing which Abram receives in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, is the beginning of the covenant, which will then be confirmed or manifest in those repetitions, those uh, re, uh, rebirth, resurrection of that covenant in those other chapters that we're going to see. And there's reasons why the covenant needs to be restored. There's things which happen in between each of those restorations in chapters What's he got it laid out there? 15, 17, and 22. There's things which take place which require a renewal of the covenant, and we'll take a look at that. But there's something deeper here in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Something literal that was placed there, not literalistic, literal that was placed there, an intention of the author, and that is to write in a structure very similar to what we saw in Genesis chapter 1 with a seven-day division to communicate something deeper. Remember, I told you that the number seven oftentimes represents the, the oath or covenant, right? Read with me chapter 12, verse 1 through 3 of Genesis, yes. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now count with me. I will make you a great nation, one, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will bless themselves." Seven repetitions to communicate this covenant relationship which God is establishing with Abram, beginning here in chapter 12. And notice the response in in verse 4. In verse 4. Or we go to verse 1 and say, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go! In verse 4, So Abram went. There's an immediate response There's no time to consider what's going on. Abram, the man of faith, leaves immediately. We're going to see him go, or he went, another time in this text without God telling him to do so. Okay? And notice in verse 4, who goes with him? Lot goes with Abram. What's the difference between what Abram's doing and what Lot's doing? If you had to make a distinction between the two, why is, is Lot going? Is Lot hearing the voice of God? Is, is Lot answering God's call? No. no. Lot is going with Abram. Guy. Yeah, but Abram is going for the sake of God. Okay? Umberto Casudo, who I have, will be quoting from in most of what I'll be saying in the first half, which I've already blown of my talk, uh, it comes from his book, Umberto Casudo, uh, a commentary on the book of Genesis from Noah to Abraham. If anyone wants to really just get into one of those books, it's going to keep you up all night. It's Casudo. Yeah. Yeah. That's a joke. Okay. It kept me up till 1030 last night reading, but unfortunately I got to the end of his book and he died. Not Abram. Casudo died in the middle of his commentary on Abraham. I couldn't believe it. I, I, was, I was distraught. Notice your map. Again, Abram goes from Ur. He makes his way 
to a heron, and he comes down the coast. There's a reason why they're claiming that he goes through these particular cities. In fact, he goes, you'll notice, the city of Damascus. Okay, why does he go through the city of Damascus? Why would the map guy make it this way? It's because in chapter 15, chapter 15, verse 2, But Abram said, O Lord God, what wilt thou give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. So there's an idea possibly, most likely, traveling from here, and he would have taken the main road, which goes right through the city of Damascus, and here in the city of Damascus, Abram picks up a slave, Okay, which gives us an indication or confirms the route which he took. In verse 7 of chapter 12, in verse 7, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Moreh, at the time the, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So he built there an altar. Notice the difference from before. Before God spoke to him. Now what does God do? He appears to him. So Abram has listened. He's accepted the word of the Lord. He's trusted in the word without confirmation. In fact, he didn't even know where he was going. God didn't tell him, you're going to the land of Canaan. He just said, go and I will show you the place. And here God appears to him. And what does he say? This is the land. This is the land that I give to your descendants. This is what you were hoping for. This is what I was calling you to. And there Abram builds an altar to the Lord. But notice it doesn't say anything about Abram sacrificing, offering oblations on that altar. Verse 8. Thence he removed to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And Aram journeyed on still going toward the Negev. So there's, a, there's a, 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 a three divisions in the story of Abram's journey from north to south. In a sense, taking possession of the whole land. We will see this again, these three locations exactly mentioned in the journey of Jacob and again in the conquest of Israel led by Joshua. They will go to these three locations. And the reason why these three locations are mentioned, especially the mention of Bethel and Shechem, is because they were major cities at the time. Excavations have shown us that at the time of Abraham, these were thriving centers. And the major highway north to south ran through these cities, and there was another road which ran east-west. East-west. And you'll notice that Abram camps, what, west or east of Bethel? East of Bethel. He, he, He camps off to the side. Why? Because there's a road running there. He goes to the main centers and there establishes altars and finally calls upon the name of the Lord. Casuto makes a point to say he didn't offer sacrifice on these, off, on these altars, and most likely these altars were not meant for sacri- sacrifice, but as memorials. As memorials. Why would Abram want to set up a memorial? What does a memorial do? What does it do? It reminds you. Yeah, it proclaims some reality. Okay, and here Abram sets up two, in a sense, witnesses to God, Yahweh, to the one who has called him. Two witnesses. In fact, we have both of these cities mentioned in the 19th century before Christ in an Egyptian text that says the Pharaoh had come up and conquered these two cities exactly. Two altars. Why would he set up these two witnesses? Because in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, and you say, why are you going to go to Deuteronomy? Remember, the tradition is that the entire Pentateuch was written by Moses. Okay? Why these two memorials or two places of witness? Because in Deuteronomy chapter 19, it says that two or three witnesses are required to establish a fact. And what is the fact that Abram is establishing? What is the fact that Abram's establishing? That God would give him this land, and more importantly, this land is Yahweh's land. He has dominion over it. And after those two witnesses are established, then Abram calls upon the name of the Lord. What does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? We saw it earlier in our text, didn't we? 
Who else called upon the name of, our, of the Lord in chapter 4 of Genesis? Remember the sons of Seth, right? It was at that time that they started to call upon the name of the Lord. What does it mean, call upon the name of the Lord? Casuto makes the same point. He says, look, Abram was a man of prayer, obviously. So to call upon the name of the Lord was not, wouldn't have, if it was a prayer that he was offering, wouldn't have been anything to write down about. But it's after these two memorials, memorials are established that he calls upon the name of the Lord in the sense of glorifying Yahweh in these places, in the public, before the people of the land, declaring that place to be under the dominion of Yahweh. Casuto says, The reference is certainly not to prayer, but to the proclamation and explanation of the Lord's name. The proclamation concerning the religion of the Lord to the inhabitants of the land. In Shechem, the Lord made his will known to Abraham. And in Bethel, Abraham made known his devotion to the Lord. In the former city, the Lord gave Abraham his promise for the future. And in the latter, the patriarch began to fulfill his mission in his new habitation. First of all, how did Abraham even know who the Lord was? How did he know Yahweh? There was a tradition among the Israelites that the worship of the one God had been passed down among very few men. Passed down from Adam to Seth to Enoch to Noah and to Shem. And ultimately received by Abraham who was going to receive the promise. But you say, what what would they have done? Abraham stands up on his soapbox in the middle of the city and says, your God doesn't exist and own this place. Yahweh does. A God that you don't know. What are they going to do to him? Yeah, they'd kill him. They'd kill him. How is it possible that he did this? First of all, we learn, and I'm not going to, just for sake of time, you can write them down. In chapter 12, we find that, that Abram goes to Egypt and immediately he finds himself in the community of Pharaoh's house. Okay, He wasn't just some poor traveler. He finds himself immediately in the hierarchy of society. In, number, in chapter 13, verse 2, it says he was extremely rich. In chapter 14, we find out that he had 300 trained men. 300 trained men. That means he's got a lot more men besides those, besides women and children. He was not what we might consider the vagabond Abraham, but he was a wealthy man who had decided to leave behind all of his lands, what he would have inherited as his kingdom, to come to a land which he did not know. In verse 6, in verse 6, In verse 6 of chapter 12, we hear that the Canaanites are dwelling in that land. And in verse 7, verse 7 of chapter 12, Abram is promised that his descendants will receive it as an inheritance. As an inheritance. Doesn't this seem unjust? Huh? God's going to take the land from somebody and give it to somebody else. I want you to hold on to that thought for a moment, okay? Because Abram does something else in verse 10 that's extremely important. We have to cover it today, even though we've only gotten through nine verses. We have next week too, don't worry. Verse 10, now there was a famine in the land, so Abraham went. Notice that repetition that we saw also in verse 4. That, it, that before God said go and Abraham went, now there's a famine in the land, so Abraham went. A good idea or a bad idea? Yeah. yeah. Abram's the man of faith, of trust. God will provide. He's told over and over again in this story, trust me, Abram. Trust me, Abraham. Trust me, I will provide the lamb, he's told Trust me. And Abram leaves and goes to Egypt in the midst of a famine. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you're a woman beautiful to behold. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this this is his wife. Then they'll kill me, but they'll let you live. 
Say you're my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared on your account. What was Abram thinking? First of all, I don't think he was planning on getting into the situation with Pharaoh. Okay? He was probably thinking of going down to Egypt. He's her brother, which means without the father there, he has the right to say no to anyone who approaches. And he probably figured, based upon his own reason, that he could protect his wife. Unfortunately, he fails. It ends up backfiring. Is Abraham lying? Is Abraham lying? Take a look at chapter 20. Keep your hand there in verse 12, but look at chapter 20. Unfortunately, Abram does this twice in his life. In chapter 20, look at verse 1. From there, Abraham journeyed uh, toward the territory of the Negev and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So the situation happens again. Look at verse 12 of that text. Or verse 10, I'm sorry. Verse 10. Verse 10. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what were you thinking that you did this thing? And Abraham said, I did it because I thought there was no fear of God in all this place. And they'll kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is indeed my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. Okay? So Abram's telling a little bit of a... He's trying to trick them. He's trying to trick them by telling them a half-truth. Oftentimes in the stories of the patriarchs, the sin of the patriarch is not revealed as sin in the sense that it's pointed out explicitly. But the results of his sin are manifest in the text for us as readers to discover. And you see that very clearly in chapter 12, um, verse 17. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. If you read that text, he comes down to Egypt. Pharaoh takes her as his wife. And now Pharaoh's afflicted with plagues because of Sarah and Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called, Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she was your sister? So I took her for my wife. Now then, here's your wife. Get out of here. I don't want to see you anymore. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away. On, uh, sent him away. Notice, what, what's Abraham do in this, in this situation? He's totally silent, isn't he? Pharaoh is the only one who speaks. Abraham remains silent because he is the one who is guilty of the sin. You can notice also in verse um, 15, and when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they, ra- they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh's name mentioned three times, confirming that Pharaoh is the one who is bested or outdone Abraham. And now there is one and only one who can extricate Sarah and Abraham from this situation, and that's God. God will act, and the plagues will come upon the plagues will come upon. Uh, Pharaoh and, and all of Egypt. Casuto says that, that, that so Ab- this was done so Abraham learns, and with him the reader of his biography, that's us, that a man must have implicit faith in God's help, and that he is forbidden to rely on his cleverness alone. The, contra- the contraventions of his prohibition brings its own punishment, for a shrewd man is liable to err. And when he thinks that he has taken precautions against every possibility, he may, overlook, he may overlook the very eventuality that is actually due to occur. So Abram learns a lesson in Egypt. He learns, number one, or we should learn a lesson from Abraham in Egypt, that he does not trust God when he goes down to Egypt. That relying upon his own wisdom, if you will, his own ruse fails him. The only one that can truly protect him is God. In chapter 13, verse 2, Abram leaves, Abram leaves Egypt. And notice, he's very rich. He despoils Egypt. He leaves Egypt an extremely rich man and takes with him gold, silver, jewelry, and so forth. 
And here we start to recognize, I hope, a little parallel in our story. The trip to Egypt with Abraham reminds you of the Exodus. Who said that? There you go. The Exodus. Notice the parallels. There is a famine. And the family of God leaves the land because of that famine. The family of God goes to Egypt. Pharaoh dominates the people. God sends plagues to free his people. Pharaoh sends them away. And the people of God despoil Egypt and carry away gold and silver and jewelry with them. You can write a little note there to Exodus 12.35 where it says that, that they left with all the gold of Egypt in their hands. They were given that gold for one purpose, that they could offer it to God. Unfortunately, in the life of Israel, they end up making a golden calf out of it. Why the parallel? Remember that this text, this text has traditionally been held to have been written by Moses who is struggling to get his people to have faith and continue their journey. Remember that point I mentioned about Deuteronomy, that two or three witnesses establishes a fact. Two or three witnesses are required to establish a fact. Sarah, in this case heads down to Egypt and is taken into Pharaoh's court. Later in chapter 20, as we've seen, with Abimelech, Abram again calls her his sister, and she's again taken into Abimelech's house. Later on in chapter 26 of Genesis, you don't have to turn there, Rebecca, Rebecca is also brought into the house of Abimelech when her husband claims that, he's, that she is his sister. Okay, and you say... These guys just can't figure it out. And you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But Moses certainly writes these three t stories down for a reason. Not because they didn't happen, but because they did happen. And because two or three witnesses are required to establish that a fact is going to take place as promised. Three times... The matriarchs of Israel were brought into a foreign king's home. In a sense, became a servant or even a, even, a, even a concubine or a harlot to a foreign husband. Sounds like Israel, doesn't it? Who's again and again called a harlot or a concubine to the foreign gods. But God, in each moment, in all three cases of witness saves the women and brings them out of that house and brings them back to the land they promised, that he promised them. Moses, writing down this text, establishes three witnesses to the fact of God's faithfulness in the midst of the people's unfaithfulness. God will be faithful reg regardless of what we do and regardless of how far we find our way away from his household. Casuto says, the thrice told tale of the deliverance of the matriarchs greatly magnifies the importance and the unfailing character of God's help. This duplication or this threefold repetition as we see is confirmed also in Genesis chapter 41 with the story of Joseph. You can write it down. Chapter 41 verse 32. Remember, there's a duplication in Pharaoh's dream. Maybe we turn there. Why not? Chapter 41, verse 32. It's worth it. Genesis 41, 32. 41, 32. And we're going to draw closed here pretty quick. Remember when Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream, he says in verse 32, and the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God. Going back to Genesis chapter 13, Abram comes back into the land and there in verse 4, he calls upon the name of the Lord again at the same location he had done before, declaring to the inhabitants of the land that God was going to be faithful to his promise. God was in control. If you look at chapter 13 verse 8, 
verse 8 through, the end, through verse 18, through the end of the chapter, we get the story of Lot. And I want you to hold on to one important part about the story of Lot. Besides the fact that he chooses the Jordan Valley, which is on the edge of the land of Canaan, it's not the heart of it. He chooses the edge of what God had promised, not the heart of it. He leaves the land of Canaan open. But notice in verse 11... So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley. And Lot journeyed in which direction? East. Is that toward or away from God? Away. away from God. Lot journeyed away from God. And look at verse 13. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Lot went to dwell in Sodom in the place of sin away from the Lord, leaving the land of promise open to Aram. And we'll finish with this in verse 14. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes, look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I will give to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your descendants also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came to dwell in the oaks of Mamre. St. Ephraim says that when Abram walked from the north to the south, from the east to the west, here he walked the sign of the cross over the promised land. Here, he says, the cross is clearly delineated that the land promised to the forefathers through the mystery of the cross because of the cross, reputed any other inheritors. Abram makes the sign of the cross over the land, declaring it to be God's and prophesying the cross of Christ. I said I'd finish with that, but I have to give you a teaser for next week, okay? A little bit of homework. A little bit of homework, because we won't have time to get into it. In chapter 14, immediately there is a war in the land. Abram has just come out of Egypt, come back into the land, claimed it for God, called upon the name of the Lord, and immediately there is a war that takes place over this land. And in the middle of that land, and in the middle of that war, a king steps forward. And that king's name is Melchizedek. And Abram is going to journey to meet that king and to receive a blessing from him in the midst of the land of Canaan, which is in a total, basically a total civil war, which is going on. We need to get into that a little bit next week, and then we're going to really fly. I'd ask you to read from here, from chapter 14 through chapter 25, verse 8, when Abraham dies. Okay? And we're going to easily be able to do it because... Because as you read, I want you to remember one line. It's going to bring sense to the entire story of Abram. Abram went to Egypt. And when he left Egypt, it was much easier to get Abram out of Egypt than to get Egypt out of Abram. I just think I missed something about yeah. um, when Abraham left for the... Uh, left for Egypt on account of this famine. Yeah. Was, that a diso was he disobeying God at this point? And that's yeah. what started all the trouble. Sure. I, I, would, just, I would say that um, you, you could go either way on it. I, I wouldn't say most commentators say that he did something wrong by going to Egypt. The problem is uh, that in the text itself, as, is, as commonly happens... Uh, the text itself reveals the reality. So oftentimes the scriptures won't, as I said, they won't tell you that the person sinned. They'll show you the results, right? Um, like with, with, uh, with, uh, with Jacob, who steal, steals his brother's birthright, and his mother is the one encouraging him to do it. And as a result, he flees his brother because his brother's going to kill him, and his mother never sees him again. Okay, so the result of the sin of tricking 
Their father, Isaac, is revealed in the story, but it's not called a sin because they had respect for their patriarchs. So when they did make a mistake, they kind of told the story and let the reader discover the problem. And that's really exactly what happens here. We're going to see over and over again in the life of Abram, and becoming Abraham, that the covenants which are given to him in chapters 15, 17, and 22 are a result of his trip to Egypt. All three of them, and this is why I was saying this is really helpful from Scott Hahn, this, this structure. However, I think it misses a little bit of the point, and that is that it's not three different covenants. It's the one covenant which was offered to Abram in, or to Adam in the beginning to participate in God's own life. This is the same covenant offered to Abram now in chapter 12 of, 12 of Genesis and then confirmed for him when, when God appears and says, here's the land. You're standing on it. And what does Abram do? The first thing he does is leave. Okay? The first thing he does is leave. And we're going to see that repetition over and over again in the story. So as you read this over this week, and I hope you'll come back next week, read those covenants as the result of what happened the chapter before and what happened the chapter before as rooted in his trip to Egypt. Good evening, Deacon. Do you think it's fair or would you draw any comparisons between Abram leaving to Egypt and then the way he treated his wife, comparing that to Adam? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all, there's a repetition over and over and over again with these guys in, in, in the Bible. They're put there as an example to us. One gentleman who couldn't stay for question and answer said, how does this have anything to do with today? I'd say, that's my life. I keep going back to Egypt, right? And God keeps being faithful to me when I find myself outside of the household of God or outside of the promised land which God has given to me. And he's always faithful. He's always there with that hand offering and saying, I'm going to bring you out of this place. I'm going to bring you out of this place. And so the life of Abraham, as the life of Adam, as the life of Noah, are repetitions of, in, in, a sen in a, some sense, the same story. Right? Uh, um, uh, Sarah here ends up in the house of Pharaoh. Um, Eve ends up in the house of the devil. She ends up speaking with the devil, communicating with the devil, right? So there's a, these parallels that take place, certainly. Other questions? We're getting a question online from okay. Kathy. Did Abraham literally live 175 years? Okay, great. I'm glad you asked the question. We have on, you grab, pull out for you your uh, little handout there that has the years that the patriarchs lived. The years that the patriarchs lived. Remember something. Remember something. Death is not normal. Death is common, but it's not normal. We are bothered by the fact in the Old Testament that people lived for hundreds of years. You should be bothered by the fact that today people die at 70 years old. The fact that they lived for hundreds and hundreds of years is much more in, in fitting with God's plan for His people than to be dying constantly all over the place, right? Death is an insult thrown into the face of God. It was an insult thrown into the face of God. So, is it possible that they lived 175 years? Absolutely. Now, how is it possible? I can't tell you, nor can the scientists tell you why exactly it is that our bodies wear down and we die. There's really no understanding of why the body just falls apart. It just does. Okay? They can't give you a clear answer to that. Some have guessed that prior, you'll notice in your, in your timeline, and this is one of the reasons why I want to give it to you, that after the flood, the years that the patriarchs lived was seriously diminished. And it's diminished evenly, like it goes downhill, except for a few people. A few people all of a sudden live a little longer, don't they? I think it's, isn't it Tira that lives, yeah. yeah, 205 years all of a sudden, right? Right, or, or what's that? So there's a, a decline, but then sometimes it bumps back up. And it, it seems to bump back up when the person's extremely important. <laughs> 
Terah was the father of Abraham. Abraham, right? He's extremely important. Like Terah is a new Noah because Abram's a new Shem. So he lives a little bit longer. But there's more to it than that. And this is the difference between a literalistic and a literal interpretation, is to try to uncover behind these years they lived some intention of the author in relating it to us. That Mo- Moses wasn't writing to just for the sake of writing, to tell you how long they lived for the sake... In fact, even today, if you go to the Middle East, the old men, you ask them how old they are, yeah, you know, I'm getting old, right? I'm getting old. There's not a clear uh, sense of exactly this many years. I was born on this date, and I dominate, okay, and so forth. Why was it written in this way? To communicate a deeper truth. In fact, you'll notice, for the most part, that the years given are either a repetition of fives. So if even uh, you know, uh, 60, 65, 70 years old, 75 years old, or, or a repetition of fives to a certain point, and then the number seven added, or sometimes the number seven is added twice, or even three times. I didn't come up with this. This is Casuto that points this out. I mean, I don't know how the guy had enough time in his life to figure all this stuff out. But it, the, the numbers are given to communicate a deeper truth, which is way beyond my knowledge of the book of Genesis. But the point is, don't do a literalistic reading. Do a literal reading. That does not mean denying that these people lived a long time. But it means that the reason their years are given is to communicate a deeper truth. And there, you can dive deeply. You say, I know the life of Abram. This is why you know, everybody wants to know about, Ish- about, about Islam, right? On Sunday, we had over 200 people okay, all right, jammed into the room, standing room only. But everybody knows about Abraham, right? Father of the faith, not interesting. We already know his story. My dear friends, there's no way. There's no way. I've been reading this story over and over and over again, and I'm still just barely scratching the surface. I was talking to my dad this morning. I said, Dad, I don't know that much about the life of Abraham. Very little. And uh, I'm doing the best I can to, to, to understand these things. The text is deep. It's rich. It would take a lifetime of investment to be able to mine the jewels that are there. Why did Abraham not take care of his wife if he she was his sister, and he could say, no, keep your hands off of her. Why did he go and uh, hide behind the woman? Look at chapter 15, verse 1. You guys know, right? What's the answer? What's the answer? He, he was afraid, right? Look at that. Chapter After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in the vision and said, Fear not, Abram. I'm in charge. Fear not. I'm going to protect you. Indicating that Abram did fear. Okay? He was scared. And again, the question is, how does this have anything to do with us? This guy living thousands of years ago. Isn't this our story? Is God really going to protect me? Is God really going to take care of me? Is, really, is God really going to make sure all of those things are in place? Uh, if, I, if, I, if I trust Him and I do these things and I live my life this way, am I really going to be okay? Right? The classic example is money. We do it all the time. I do it myself. I'm always worried. Do we have enough money in the bank? Are we going to make it next month? Rather than saying, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to be faithful to God's mission that He's given me in my life. And God's going to provide for me. And I'll just use the Institute as an example. We trusted God. We did it. And look at what God has provided for us way beyond our wildest imagination of what he's, what he's done for us. And uh, so the same stories in the life of, of, of Abraham, he feared, he didn't trust. And that struggle, it's not that Abraham wasn't a, a faithful man, right? It's that he's, he's conflicted. He's conflicted back and forth. Okay? Sound good? All right. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week. Okay. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-4000.
7155. And may the glory of Christ's church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.